All right, well, good morning. Thank you for being here. We're going to be uh, in 1 Timothy chapter 1 this morning, hearing from the Apostle Paul what God says through him in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 8 through 11. Let me open this up in a word of prayer. God, it is so good to be under your care, to know you, to be known by you, to be loved by you. God, we know that you know all things, you control all things, you only do what is right and just and good and true. And so to have you as our father is a tremendous privilege like no other, to have been adopted by you and now to be cared for you, uh, cared for by you as your children, um, like every good father you've given us, good rules to live by, good standards to walk by as members of your family. And we could not improve on what you've given us in your word. You've given us sufficient instructions as you've spoken with all authority. And you've taught us how we ought to live, how we ought to walk, not only because it glorifies you, but because this is what is good for us. Your word tells us that the one who knows you, uh, who walks according to your wisdom, is blessed. And blessed is the one who finds wisdom, who gets understanding. For the gain from her is better than gain from silver, and her profit is better than gold. God, there is nothing that we can desire that could possibly compare with your word. Even this morning as people come in with various concerns, uh, things on their minds, things that have happened during the week and in their homes and on their jobs, uh, we have plenty of concerns and desires, certainly, but God, none of them compares with your word, with your wisdom. And so even as we uh, as I sit here and uh, as I teach from the pulpit, as your people gather here and hear these words, God, I pray that you would remove all distractions and that we would look to you with undivided attention, that we would look to hear from your word, knowing that what we need most this morning is found in this book. God, we don't have any reason to apologize for looking to your word in that way for putting all of our hope, all of our trust, all of our confidence in what you have said. Because as we look into what you've revealed, we get you. We get you in your words in the fullest way possible. To hear your voice is to hear your heart, to know your character, and so I pray that because of the hour that we spend this morning looking at this text, that you would make us better for it, that we would be sanctified, that we would walk away from this time more in awe of your sufficient word, more eager to obey your voice, more zealous to listen and hear you speak over and over and over again from your word. We need that, God. And certainly those are divine realities that we can't conjure up on our own. We can't give ourselves a sincere heart, pure desires, a good conscience, a sincere faith. Those are all gifts from you, God, and yet you tell us to strive for them. And so we pray that you would be kind to us this morning and that you would fulfill our longing 
and giving us more of yourself. In Christ's name, amen. In 1530, William Tyndale was busy translating the New and Old Testament for the very first time into English from the original Hebrew and Greek. This had never been done before because the Catholic Church was in control, had power, and refused to allow God's word to be translated into the language of the common people. And particularly in England, this was forbidden. It was only under threat of death that men and women could own an English Bible. Um, what was available at that time was the work of John Wycliffe. And that was the best that you had. No one spoke Latin. That was, that's what was available. And that's what you would hear in a mass. And so William Tyndale, being convinced that men and women needed God's word in a way that they could actually read for themselves, being convinced that the key to <clears throat> being freed from every error and superstition that was being taught at the time, he went into exile so that he could produce an English translation <clears throat> and we still benefit from his work, even in the Bibles that we're currently reading. He was certainly ahead of his time. Once he was done translating the New Testament, he began translating the Old. And in his prologue to the entire Old Testament, um, what he put before Genesis... Here is what he says about the scriptures. Though a man had a precious jewel and a rich, yet if he wist not the value thereof, nor wherefore it served, he were neither the better nor richer of a straw. Even so, though we read the scripture and babble of it never so much, Yet if we know not the use of it, and wherefore it was given, and what is therein to be sought, it profiteth us nothing at all. So now the scripture is a light, and showeth us the true way, both what to do, and what to hope for, and a defense from all error, and a comfort in adversity, that we despair not, and feareth us, cause us to fear, in prosperity that we sin not. This is what he put at the beginning of the Old Testament. When he talks about Scripture being a light that shows us the true way, both what to do, what to hope for, a defense from all error, a comfort in adversity, so that we don't despair, the means by which God puts fear in us so that even in prosperity we refuse to sin. He's thinking of the Old Testament. And what was he convinced that people needed from the scriptures? His solution to understanding the depths even of the Old Testament, he says this, this comfort shalt thou evermore find in the plain text and literal sense. He was so convinced of the clarity of God's word that he thought, if I just give the people a Bible that they can understand, they will be free. They will have access to the comfort that God intends.
the Apostle Paul in 1 Timothy chapter 1 really lays out a similar conviction when it comes to the Old Testament. In verses 8 through 11, Paul has to backpedal slightly to just make sure that he is being clear about what he thinks about the Old Testament. Because of what he has to defend in his letter to Timothy and the instructions that he gives, he has to clarify, qualify what he's just said and make known what he actually thinks about the Old Testament. And that's what we find in verses 8 through 11. We'll start at verse 3 and just get a running start at the context. Paul writes to his son in the faith, Timothy, As I urged you upon my departure from Macedonia, remain on at Ephesus so that you may instruct certain men not to teach strange doctrines, nor to pay attention to myths and endless genealogies which give rise to mere speculation, rather than furthering the administration of God which is by faith. But the goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. For some men, straying from these things, have turned aside to fruitless discussion, wanting to be teachers of the law, even though they do not understand either what they are saying or the matters about which they make confident assertions. But we know that the law is good if... The law is good if one uses it lawfully, realizing the fact that law is not made for a righteous person, but for those who are lawless and rebellious, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and profane, for those who kill their fathers or mothers, for murderers and immoral men and homosexuals and kidnappers and liars and perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to sound teaching, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God with which I have been entrusted. The purpose of this passage is that a lawful use of the law requires knowledge of two indispensable details. What Paul is communicating here, what God is communicating through his apostle, is that a lawful use of the law requires knowledge of two indispensable details. First, it's sanctifying priority for God's people in verses 8 through 10. It's sanctifying priority for God's people is the first indispensable detail that we must know to discern what is a lawful use of the law. In verse 8, he says, but we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully. The reason he has to say, but we know, is because of what he's just said in verse 7, that these men who have strayed from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith and have turned aside instead to fruitless discussion... They were wanting to be teachers of the law. But he says that those men, those teachers in the church in Ephesus, did not understand what they were saying and didn't understand the matters about which they make confident assertions. Their ignorance about what the Old Testament was actually saying was accompanied by confidence. And that is a really unhelpful place to be. Confident in things you know nothing about. You don't know what you're talking about, but you're confident. That was what was happening in Ephesus in these men who were teaching error in the church. What what Paul is aware of that was happening in Ephesus, even in his absence, he's gone to Macedonia, left Timothy there, to shepherd alongside the other elders. Men were opening up the scriptures 
which before the New Testament was finished, this is primarily what they had, the Old Testament. When you came to Ephesus, you were likely to hear a sermon from the Old Testament. What they were doing was opening up the scriptures that they had available to them. Paul calls it the law. And because these men, according to verse 6, had strayed from these things, the things that he just mentions in verse 5, a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith, because these men had strayed from those things, literally, they were turned aside to fruitless discussion. Their teaching was fruitless. They wandered into error almost in an in a inadvertently, in a passive way, because they had already turned aside from a pious inner life. That's even instructive for us. The battle for your doctrine, the battle for purity in your doctrine is one at the heart level. You drift away from a pious, a pure inner life, and your doctrine can't help but follow. Without any effort on your part, you may not go searching out error on purpose, but if you don't keep your heart, the wellspring from which all of life flows, you will lose your doctrinal moorings. And wherever there is egregious error being taught in the church, you can be sure, you can bank on it, you can take God at his word that the person teaching the egregious error has wandered away from a pure inner life. That's what was happening in Ephesus. And these men, who didn't know what they were talking about, opened up the Old Testament scriptures to teach. The effect that it had on the church, verse 4, was speculation. Speculation. These men had given their attention to myths and endless genealogies. Where in the world would they find genealogies that they could go on and on and on about that became endless from which they could fabricate a tall tale, a myth. Well, you have just in your Old Testament, you know this if you've been on a reading plan, there are many genealogies in the Old Testament. In Genesis alone, you get genealogies in chapters 4 with Cain, chapter 5 with Adam, chapter 10, Noah's genealogy, chapter 11, the genealogy of Shem as Moses narrows the focus to get to Abraham. You get another genealogy in chapter 25 of Genesis with Ishmael and chapter 36 with Esau. And then chapter 46, finally, with Jacob or Israel. But even outside of Genesis, you get more genealogies in Exodus chapter 6, Numbers chapter 3. The first nine chapters of Chronicles are all genealogies written for the generation that was in exile. And you get another genealogy even in Ezra chapter 2. The Old Testament is filled with genealogies. You shouldn't skip those, by the way, in your reading plan. If God thought they were important enough to put there, they are also intended for your instruction. As difficult as they may be for modern readers to get through, that still holds true. And so when Paul's talking about what, they were, what these men were teaching from, he certainly has in mind at least the Torah, at least the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, 
which are often referred to specifically as the law, right? The law. What Moses wrote in Old and New Testament is referred to as the law. But in Ephesus, wherever a genealogy could be found, these teachers could have practiced what we read about here. To read between the lines and talk about these obscure Old Testament characters about which nothing else is written, but this would make for a really good story on a Sunday morning. This would, this would make for a really captivating story during the week when the church was gathered. And I could actually open up the scriptures and say, we're going to be in God's word today, and then say whatever I wanted from a perverted conscience. This is what was happening in Ephesus. And notice in verse 4 that what was the effect on the people, people would come eager to hear from God's word, God's word would be taught, quote-unquote, and then people would leave and speculate. They would speculate. They would leave with more questions than they came with. They would leave with a sense not to say what God actually said or be impressed with what was actually written, but a trail of perhaps doctrinal musings, things that seem plausible, because, of course, God's word was open. We must have been in the Bible. Speculation was the result in the congregation instead of what Paul calls furthering the administration of God, which is by faith. What is the administration of God, which is by faith? What has God entrusted to his church to do, to steward and be about if they believe, his believing household? What has he given them to do? Paul actually tells us in the next verse. But the goal of our instruction, in contrast to that instruction that produces speculation merely, is love from these things. That's what God has given the church to do, primarily. Love. And not just any kind of love, but love that is produced by piety, a truly godly life at the heart level, piety. This is love that comes from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Purity, true purity, true goodness, true sincerity. When it comes to the heart, the conscience, and faith, things that you can't see. Purity at that level, piety at that level, was supposed to be producing love between the members of the church. What was supposed to flow out of the people sitting under biblical instruction was love that departed from a pious inner life that wasn't happening because of the way these men were teaching and how they were using the law. They were using the law unlawfully. And so Paul, in verse 8, says, They're ignorant, but we know, we're not ignorant, we know that the law is actually good. The law is actually good. The teaching of these men should not cast any aspersion on the goodness of God's word in the Old Testament. It is good still, even though it's not used well, is the idea. It is good if one uses it lawfully. Just like a weapon in the hands of someone with good intentions, with good motives, who's just and upright. I want law enforcement to have the law enforcement officers like a Jeremy Evans, like a Dan Melantine, right, who are just, who are upright men. We want them to have weapons to defend the innocent and, in the case they need to, punish evil doing. 
evildoers. But you take that same weapon and put it in the hands of someone who intends evil, well, it's no longer good, is it? That's the point that Paul is making about God's word. It is good on the condition that someone actually uses it for the purpose for which it was given. If one uses the law lawfully, great, it's good. And we know this knowing, verse 9, realizing this fact, that the law is not made for a righteous person. The law is not made for a righteous person. This is where Paul, again, is, is emphasizing the sanctifying priority of the law for God's people. The Old Testament is intended to sanctify you. That is a priority of the Old Testament. Because Paul says it's not intended for a righteous person. Well, those are people who don't need the law, people who refrain from sin, but who does need the law? Who does need the Old Testament that God wrote for this purpose? Well, those who are lawless and rebellious for the ungodly and sinners, Paul says, for the unholy and profane, for those who kill their fathers or mothers, for murderers and immoral men and homosexuals and kidnappers and liars and perjurers and whatever else is contrary to sound teaching. Reading that list, you're tempted, probably, like I am, to think, oh, yeah, in evangelism, I got to bring the law. Because unbelievers who do these kinds of things, they need to hear God's law. They need to hear the Old Testament, what God has told us to do, examples in the Old Testament. They really need to hear that. Because these are the kind of people who would, you know, kill their fathers and mothers. You're tempted to think of evangelism. Paul doesn't have unbelievers in mind, outside of the church at least. Paul is saying the use of the law for those teachers in the church. If the law was taught and used lawfully inside the church and aimed at these kinds of people, that would be a good use of the law. Why? Well, because the, the kinds of people he's listing here in verses 9 and 10, they don't only exist outside of the church. They exist within the church, especially when you consider the way he ended verse 10, and whatever else is contrary to sound teaching. Do you not commit sins contrary to sound teaching? Of course you do. I do. We do sin in ways that are contrary to even the sound teaching we know. And so we need teachers, even in our church, like they did in Ephesus, who keeping their own life pure, will use the law lawfully. This, by the way, was the intended purpose of the law to produce holy living. Moses tells us this in the law itself, Deuteronomy chapter 4. Here's what he says in verses 5 to 8. When he gave the law, here he is ending the law that he's going to hand to the second generation. He's going to send them into Canaan. And then he's going to have them make their own Bible wall of sorts on rocks, on giant rocks that they're supposed to set up in Canaan. They're supposed to write the law. On these, on these large stones, you should go look when you have a chance at where the, the Torah ends, Genesis through Deuteronomy, 
and then remind yourself, wow, they had to copy that on stones. And what was supposed to be the effect of being inundated with God's word in Israel once they entered into the land? Verse 5, see, I have taught you statutes and judgments just as Yahweh my God commanded me that you should do thus in the land where you are entering to possess it. So keep them and do them, for that is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples who will hear all these statutes and say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. That's no coincidence. You practice the very wisdom and understanding that I am giving you, and people will say, wow, that's wise and understanding. For what great nation is there that, a God so, that has a God so near to it as is Yahweh our God whenever we call on him? Or what great nation is there that has statutes and judgments as righteous as this whole law which I am setting before you today. The Old Testament was supposed to be a witness to demonstrate God's righteousness. As other people observed the obedience of Israel to the very words of God. The law was intended to sanctify Israel when it was given, to be a standard for upright living. And so the standard for New Testament teachers doesn't change. When someone in the New Testament, like a teacher in Ephesus, like a teacher in Tempe, opens up the Old Testament, it should be producing holiness of life for God's people, from which they become better more capable lovers of others. You know, you think about this list that's mentioned in verses 9 and 10. I mean, do these people really exist in the church? It's almost like Paul is picking the worst of all mankind. Well, until he gets to verses uh, 13 through 15, where he calls himself the chief of sinners. So he puts himself at the front of that list, at the top of that list. Paul was religious. Paul knew his Old Testament. And he says he was worse than these people. Do these people really exist among God's people? Even today? Lizzie Andrew Borden, probably a name you're not familiar with. I, uh, I wanted to put this to the test and see, you know, historically, what people like this might exist in the church. Well, Lizzie Andrew Borden was one of them. Born in 1860, died in 1927. She was very religious lived in Fall River, Massachusetts, attended Central Congregation Church. She taught Sunday school to immigrant children. She was the secretary treasurer for an organization called the Young People Society of Christian Endeavor. The mission of the Young People Society of Christian Endeavor was to promote an earnest Christian life among its members, to increase their mutual acquaintanceship, and to make them more useful in the service of God. Almost sounds similar to uh, what Paul said biblical instruction is supposed to produce. She was a member of this organization, um, heavily involved in the church in Massachusetts. Well, in 1893, Lizzie was tried and acquitted for killing her father and stepmother with a hatchet the year prior. She was envious 
of her father's wealth, felt like she had been overlooked among her other children. She hated her stepmother, who she believed married her father for his wealth. And so on a day in August of 1892, while she was alone with her stepmother in the home, she struck her stepmother with this hatchet, and once she fell to the ground, she hit her repeatedly 17 more times in the back of the head. Her father came home about an hour and a half later, and as he slept on the couch, she killed him in a similar way. She was one who is included in this list who would kill their fathers and mothers. And of course, she's not the only one among God's people who's done something so egregious, so heinous. You have biblical examples of people doing the same. Absalom being a a most notable example, attempted to kill his father numerous times as he took over the throne, even plotted for four years to overthrow his father and won the hearts of the people. So he was a man who possessed a perverted conscience for quite a while. After he killed his brother, he planned against his father years later and sought to take his life. You have pagans doing the same thing. Uh, the Sennacherib, the Assyrian king's sons, Adramelech and Sherezer, killed Sennacherib. And then you even have Jesus' own testimony in Matthew chapter 10, verse 21, that this wasn't a problem with barbaric people in the Old Testament. But this would even be true in New Testament times, even as his disciples sought to be faithful to his own commissioning. Matthew 10, 21, he says, Brother will betray brother to death, and the father his child. And children will rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death. You will be hated by all because of my name, but it is the one who has endured to the end who will be saved. These are people who exist among God's people who commit these sins. And everything in this list goes together. Make no mistake about it. Immoral men, homosexuals, as it's you know, Pride Month this month, some have read this list and said, this is proof that the, the Bible isn't good because God would put homosexuals in a list with murderers and people who would murder their father and mother and kidnappers and liars. They belong in this list as well. It is true. Kidnappers, you think about early American history. Frederick Douglass' testimony was that if the church stopped supporting, just stopped participating, if people who named the name of Christ in the 16 and 1700s, just refused to participate themselves in the industry of slavery, it wouldn't last a few hours. It was people in the church who were perpetuating the injustice of slavery in early American history. And so this is certainly fitting that the kind of teaching that comes from teachers in the New Testament church would take aim at purifying the life of congregants, of the people within the church. And not only the worst of sins, as we might think of it, but again, verse 10, whatever else is contrary to sound teaching, whatever else is contrary to sound teaching. 
impatient parents are contrary to sound teaching. Harsh husbands are acting contrary to sound teaching. Unsubmissive wives are acting contrary to sound teaching. Disobedient children are acting contrary to sound teaching. And so when the Old Testament's opened up, you should expect to be convicted. (laughs) You should want to be convicted. You should look forward to having areas of your life pressed on and challenged so that you can possess a more pure inner life, so that you can grow in piety at the heart level. Not so that you can look down on others who are not as pious as you, but again, verse 5, the goal is not to be pious for the sake of being pious. The goal is to be pious for the sake of love. Your ability to love others is directly tied to your own personal holiness. Do not delude yourself to thinking that you love people well while you continue on in unrepentant sin or excuse sin, sinful practices. You're, you only love as well as you are holy. And so anyone desiring to love others will be eager to be sanctified by God's word. And it's helpful that Paul goes on in verse 11 to the second detail that we must be aware of if we are to discern a lawful use of the law. And that is the law's shared purpose with God's gospel. The Old Testament is intending to sanctify God's people. And that is no different an aim than the New Testament gospel. And all those who believe what was taught by the apostles in the New Testament will find this a comfort, will see the similarity. The law shares its purpose with God's gospel, and that's the point he makes in verse 11. According to the glorious gospel of the blessed God with which I have been entrusted. Whatever else is contrary to sound teaching is what the law is taking aim at. That sound teaching, what is contrary, verse 11, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God with which I have been entrusted. This gospel, all of the, the, the new details, if you will, that were filled in, not previously known in the Old Testament. Who would come? Who is he? When is he going to come? The apostles, being now aware of those details since they were fulfilled, taught the gospel with those things in mind. That is what they taught. The Messiah has come. We've known that he's been coming. Well, he came. His name, we now know, is Jesus. Jesus of Nazareth, he was the long-awaited Messiah. He has come. He has accomplished salvation for all who will believe. This was the apostles' gospel. And that gospel that the apostles taught obviously made the goal of their instruction as they taught the gospel to purify, to sanctify God's people, as we've already seen in verse 5. That's what the New Testament teaching from the apostles was intended to do. It was to sanctify God's people, not to just bask in already being saved. The New Testament gospel was not taught for the mere sake of being justified and to just reflect over and over again that I've been justified, praise God. 
I'm no longer under God's condemnation. There is no more condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I've been adopted by God, redeemed by Christ's blood, forgiven completely and fully by Christ. Now have the indwelling spirit with me in a way not ever known in redemptive history. Those things are true, but the New Testament gospel is not for the sake of just knowing those things or just having those things be true, those indicative realities of the gospel. What's the, what's the New Testament teaching? What's the gospel intended to do for those who believe? It's intended to sanctify you. It's intended to cause you to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. It's intended to produce a striving after godliness. And similar to the uh, Ephesian error that Paul is addressing here, people were opening up the Old Testament even, being New Testament teachers and not sanctifying their New Testament audience. And unfortunately, the same can be true of many New Testament teachers today. They've taken not only Old Testament teaching, not only Old Testament passages, but also New Testament teaching, New Testament passages, and fallen into the same error. They haven't, in their teaching, promoted holiness of life. And so we should be aware and not fall into that same error. The New Testament gospel that belongs, that is about the blessed God, the God who is all glorious, self-satisfied, dwelling in unapproachable light, his gospel is intended to sanctify us. And so you even see there God's unchanging purpose for his people. That same God who engineered and then fulfilled the gospel, what he intends for New Testament saints, what he intends for you, believer, when you sit under biblical instruction, is the same thing that he has always intended for his people. He has always been after and prioritized holiness. Uh, John mentioned last week uh, the, the charge that biblical teachers often get. You talk about sin too much. You guys don't talk enough about the gospel. Well, if you're looking for a gospel that doesn't address sin so often, if you're looking for a gospel that doesn't place demands on your life to live in a way that is righteous, then you're not looking for a biblical gospel. What you want to hear from the pulpit is not God's gospel. It's a gospel of your own imagination. That's not what God is after. Every truth, every reality about what God has graciously done for us in the gospel, everything that God has accomplished for you, Christian, apart from you, all of those wonderful, marvelous truths that we love, that we had nothing to do with, that were accomplished purely of grace on our behalf, God made you aware of them so that you are eager to obey him. That's the intended aim. That's the intended effect of all of those wonderful truths. God was kind to you so that you would obey him. God is gracious to us so that we would be more eager to submit, so that we would be more convinced in our own minds that the same God who would be so kind in the gospel, we can trust him when he gives us good commands that in a moment might feel like a burden, but it's the same God. Wives, when God tells you to submit to your imperfect husband, is that a good command? Have you ever questioned, can God be trusted when he tells me to submit to my wayward husband? Maybe it's an unbelieving husband. Maybe it's a hypocritical husband. Maybe it's a husband who's just not obeying the word in some area of life. Can you trust that God when he tells you 
that it's right to submit to him, to, his, to your husband? Absolutely. Isn't he the same God that graciously saved you? Didn't he, wasn't it kind when he told you, repent and believe? Didn't you love that he told you to repent and believe the gospel? And he saved you through that command? Was that good? Absolutely. Then when he tells you other commands, like submit to your husband, you can trust him. God is good. This, uh, the different command comes from the same God. Husbands, when God tells you to do hard things, like die to your own desires, serve your wife like Christ gave up himself for the church, to go back again and patiently discipline that wayward child when he requires you to courageously lead in your home, even though it's going to be hard work and maybe you have to patiently lead your wife against her will and shepherd her to think rightly about something she's not thinking rightly about. And so the result, at least for a time, is no peace in the home because my husband's just committed to obeying God rather than yielding to his wife's will or his child's demands when that's hard. Can you trust God in the midst of that difficulty? Absolutely. It's the same God who graciously saved you through the gospel. And so we can trust him when he tells us to do hard things. The Old Testament, the New Testament share a sanctifying purpose. Briefly, how does the, how does the Old Testament in particular, what, what should this do to us, to our thinking about the Old Testament? Again, I, I'm so thankful we got the Bible all up because it's a, a new illustration in so many ways. Just notice how many panels on the wall are the Old Testament. And then you've got a few on the corner that are, that's your New Testament. The New Testament's great. Love your New Testament. Read your New Testament. Memorize your New Testament. But don't neglect your Old Testament. That's most of your Bible. That's most of what God has revealed. And in truth, if you want to understand your New Testament better, if you want to have a new appreciation for what's taught in the New Testament, then know your Old Testament better. As one pastor said, all roads, referring to biblical, you know, in the New Testament, all roads lead back to Torah. That's right. Every biblical writer is building on what Moses wrote. And the better acquainted you are with Moses, then the better you will know your New Testament, the better you'll understand New Testament teaching. Don't neglect your Old Testament. Don't skip the genealogies. Don't skip the doxologies. Don't skip Leviticus. Don't skip Chronicles. It's all good. It's all intended to make you more holy, to help you love God better. How does the Old Testament sanctify us? Briefly, it reveals God's character to us. The God who is to be obeyed and feared and loved. The Old Testament reveals that God. That's how it intends to sanctify us. By just unveiling God's character and all of his glory to us so that we stand in awe of God. You have statements in the Old Testament, claims made about God's greatness that aren't even found articulated the same way in any New Testament passage. 
Job 37, 22. Out of the north comes golden splendor. God is clothed with awesome majesty. The Almighty, we cannot find him. He is great in power. Justice and abundant righteousness, he will not violate. Therefore, men fear him. He does not regard any who are wise in their own conceit. Job 36, 22. Behold, God is exalted in his power. Who is a teacher like him? Who has prescribed for him his way? Or who can say, you have done wrong? Remember to extol his work of which men have sung. All mankind has looked on it. Man beholds it from afar. Behold, God is great and we know him not. The number of his years is unsearchable. Job 34.10, Therefore, hear me, you men of understanding. Far be it from God that he should do wickedness and from the Almighty that he should do wrong. For according to the work of a man, he will repay him, and according to his ways, he will make it befall him. Of a truth, God will not do wickedly, and the Almighty will not pervert justice. Who gave him charge over the earth, and who laid on him the whole world? If he should set his heart to it and gather to himself his spirit and his breath, all flesh would perish together, and man would return to dust. If you have understanding, hear this. Listen to what I say. Shall one who hates justice govern? Will, not, will you condemn him who is righteous and mighty, who says to a king, worthless one, and to nobles, wicked man, who shows no partiality to princes, nor regards the rich, nor th more than the poor, for they are all the work of his hands? In a moment they die. At midnight the people are shaken and pass away, and the mighty are taken away but by no human hand. For his eyes are on the ways of a man, and he, and he sees all his steps. There is no gloom or deep darkness where evildoers may hide themselves. Just powerful statements about the greatness of God's justice and the greatness of his character. You don't have that articulated in the same way in any other passage. Where, where else are you going to get that if you don't read your Old Testament? Read your Old Testament. Obviously, the Old Testament gives us commands to obey, just principles that are timeless in the, uh, for, for all time in the Old Testament. Instructions, for example, in Proverbs for children, Hear, my son, your father's instruction, and forsake not your mother's teaching, for they are a graceful garland for your head and pendants for your neck. And then he goes on in Proverbs chapter 1 to tell his son what kind of friends to choose. You can't get that articulated in the same way in any New Testament passage. We need the Old Testament. We need Proverbs chapter 1. Children need Proverbs chapter 1. Parents need Proverbs chapter 1 to instruct their parental instruction. And then obviously the Old Testament is intended to sanctify because it gives us wonderful examples of good and evil that you, you don't find anywhere else. Just the, the examples of good and evil are instructive in themselves. Paul uses those uh, most notably in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 where he gives three stories all taken from the wilderness generation. And then he tells us the purpose for which these things were written. Verse 11, now these things happened to them as an example, and they were written for our instruction upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. No temptation have, has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. And God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will provide the way of escape also, so that you will be able to endure it. Those things were written for our instruction, 
And if you are wise, you will be instructed by those instructive examples. Even being warned that those common temptations that you experience were also experienced by them, and they failed. And the person who's rightly reading his Old Testament would be warned by those examples to not complain, to not grumble, to not test God in the same ways currently as that former generation. The Old Testament is good for these things. We should be eager to let it have its perfect work in our lives, to not put demands on God what we need to see this morning as we open up God's word for a quiet time, for example, but to just let it have its perfect work, whatever God has to say to us today, be eager to receive all of it and be sanctified for it. Again, all for the sake of love. God, thank you so much for your word. We could never articulate your truth in a way that you did so perfectly, so perfectly suited for our weaknesses. God, make us humble in the face of what you've spoken as we even sit under your voice this morning again from Psalm 51. I pray that you would use your word to sanctify your people, that where there is sin, we would be convicted, where there is unrepentance, that we would change and believe that you know best for us and embrace all that you have in your instruction for our lives. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.